This is Defender Radio. I'm Michael Howie, and this is Defender Radio, the podcast for wildlife advocates and animal lovers, brought to you by the Fur Bearers. Any time spent watching chimpanzees is valuable and enjoyable. They show tool use, complex social structures and behaviors, and, according to what I've read in the latest science, are often adorable. It's no surprise that humans are fascinated by chimpanzees, as we share 98.8% of our DNA with them. But how humans treat chimpanzees isn't always positive. Chimps are still poached for meat and are kept as pets or entertainment. On social media, chimps are dressed up, paraded about, and earn significant revenue for their owners and social media platforms. Tragically, these platforms have little in place to protect potentially exploited animals, and that's something Dr. Jake Brooker wants to see change. A research associate at Durham University working at Chumfunchi Wildlife Orphanage Trust, Dr. Brooker is studying the behavior of rescued chimpanzees who were taken from the pet and bushmeat trades. In a recent article on TheConversation.com, Dr. Brooker outlined the realities chimps face as a result of social media and the ongoing plight of wild chimpanzees. To share more about his experiences with the chimpanzees of Chumfunchi, what he's learned about their incredible behavior, emotional lives, and social structures, and how animal lovers can help protect chimpanzees, Dr. Brooker joins Defender Radio. So anyways, I thought to start, let's just find out a bit about Chimfunchi Wildlife Orphanage Trust. It's it's a fascinating organization uh, dealing with a, a really incredible situation. Uh, and I think that's probably just, let's learn more about it before we get into uh, some of the issues. For sure. So uh, Chimfunchi Wildlife Orphanage uh, started in 1983, I guess, um, somewhat officially. Uh, it wasn't intended. It was uh, purely by accident. Um, there were two British expats uh, called Dave and Sheila Siddle, who bought a cattle ranch in um, in the Copper Belt province of, uh, of Zambia. And they were, I guess, just minding their own business one day when um, a game ranger um, showed up at their doorstep with um, a two-year-old chimpanzee called Pau. Um, and he had uh, all kinds of scars over his body and he was really sick and they they looked at him and just didn't think that he was ever gonna be able to survive um so they uh being animal lovers um for like all of their lives they they just decided to do whatever was necessary to uh, to save this chimp's life and so they they cared for him daily um they did yeah they gave him medicine and uh, a lot of comfort that he was desperately in need of and uh, he is still alive today. Uh, he still lives at Chimfunchi um, alongside, incredible. yeah, alongside uh, many other chimps that have come from similar circumstances. Because basically, once the word got out that these guys can take uh, rescued chimps, um, then suddenly they just started <laughs> coming really, really mm-hmm. quickly. Um, and I th- yeah, I think in maybe their first in the first couple of years, they had maybe ten chimps come through. And um, up to, up to now, it's been. Uh, at least a hundred. Um, I'm working on a on a database uh, at the moment, and I'm getting all the old records. So yeah, it's at least a hundred that have um, come from similar sad circumstances. Um, and so now it's it's expanded from this place where they basically were looking after this chimp in their home that they um, somewhere that they wanted to just retire and have a nice quiet life. Um, it's gone from looking after a few chimps in their home to now a uh this really big trust this really big charity with um many hectares of land i can't remember exactly how big it is but it takes us um it, it it's something like uh 25 kilometers i think from wow. from one end to the other for me to cycle if i <laughs> if i want to go from the furthest enclosures to the to the other furthest ones away it would yeah. be 25 kilometers so it's really really big um and they have yeah some of the enclosures are as big as um i think it's like 250 acres uh they, t- they take two hours to walk all the way around you know they're really big so wow. they have so much uh space that they can roam and they can nest independently they can forage um and they also have been able to build up these really nice long-term complex social relationships so 
yeah, they're doing they're, they're doing well in these circumstances. Yeah, yeah, yeah no sure. kidding. Uh, I'd like to talk a bit about. I mean, I want to get into all the other stuff, but just reading that. So you yourself, you're a psych, a comparative psychologist who studies social and emotional behavior of great apes. So we can yes. kind of couch you into this now too. What does that look like? Are you, you know, following them around in a lab coat or do you hang out in a tree stand or use webcams? How, how do you study that? And how did you end up studying great apes? Because I think that's fascinating on its own. I have a lot of questions about that. <laughs> For sure. Um, well, I guess I, I can start there. So uh, um, if I'm completely honest, it didn't really, uh, and animals didn't really interest me that much when I was a child. Um, mm -hmm. It took me until I was about the age of 20 before I started. I suddenly had a revolution and uh, I was always I was studying psychology. I was fascinated with um, with the mind, uh, particularly, I think, my own mind, because I think that's maybe how a lot of psychologists get into it. They start to think, like, why do I why do I think and behave like like the way that I do? And um, I was always really interested in being a clinical psychologist at first um, and like working directly with people. But then uh, towards the end of my bachelor's, I decided that um, evolutionary psychology was my um, was my direction. Uh, I watched a uh, YouTube documentary about Coco the gorilla. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you know about about her, yeah. Um, and I was I was just amazed that like people could uh, could study this kind of stuff, and um, and I was really fascinated by her and uh, and then other stories of 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 like famous chimps and uh, gorillas from from the past. And then I read. Uh, I, I, t I told. I remember. I told this to my brother, and he bought me *In the Shadow of Man* by Jay, by Jane Goodall. Yep. And um, he, I think, yeah, he, he thought, oh, th this sounds like something that he would be interested in. So let's try and you know foster that uh, that enthusiasm. Um, and I read that book, and I was just blown away. And I just thought, like, this. I want to do this. Like, I <laughs> I want to mm -hmm. go and live with these guys and and study them and watch them and um, and know as much as there is to know about them. Um, and so then I, I decided to do um, a master's that like bridged my bachelor's into um, from psychology into more anthropology, anthropology and primatology. And then, um, yeah, it took me um, it took me a few years to find uh, to find the right PhD. Um, I started looking into other areas and um, I did a bit of traveling um, and like working in the meantime to uh, to fund travels to go and uh, see uh, primate in the wild um and also i discovered a lot of sanctuaries as well when i was I traveled to asia and i discovered um how how big these sanctuaries are and like how uh, how popular they can be with tourists and um i saw the kind of best and worst of them and at the time i maybe didn't really i didn't really know much about animal welfare and like how they can or should be kept in these kind of conditions and um so yeah i, I learned a lot during that experience and it just made me more determined to uh to to go down this path and so i i managed to get a, a position looking at wild chimps for a few months so i finally like achieved that dream um and uh in <laughs> i guess in like true fashion i saw the chimps two times in two months uh in my during my placement which was um the first time was like a week before i left um and it was when i was going to we were, we were trekking uh, to go and camp somewhere for um, for a few nights, and we were just walking past this forest patch, and I heard like this really loud bark. And at first, we thought it was a baboon, and then um, we just looked, and we could see some chimps, just wild chimps that are completely un unhabituated. So these guys just uh, just do their own thing, um, and I just saw them like nesting in the trees, and I was like, ah. Oh. They are here, thank God, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it made yeah the whole trip kind of worth it and. Yeah, then I found um, then I found the, uh, the right PhD um, with uh, Dr. Zana Clay of Durham University and uh, studying empathy, which was something I'd also become really interested in um, in humanism and morality, and uh, and then it led me into looking at uh, the origins of empathy and study the study of that from a comparative approach, and that just yeah, I guess it all kind of compounded. The, uh, my sort of like chaotic past is so I compounded into one um, direction into that and uh, yeah since yeah since starting my PhD I've, um, I've been mainly working uh, here at Chimfunchi so I came the sort of sanctuary link came back and um, it's been a really great area to to do this kind of comparative work because there are um, not only really unique individuals in all of the different groups but there are these really unique groups and social climates and cultures that 
vary a lot and we see them change over time and adapt depending on uh, the behaviors of the individuals in there and um, and how the relationships change over time and the integration of, of new individuals too. Um, and so, yeah, um, like, yeah, I guess uh, how it looks like on a day-to-day -day basis is me cycling my rickety bike um, to, uh, to the enclosures uh, with a whistle and a scruffy hat and just watching them all day. We do sometimes uh, experiments. At the moment, I'm working on um, a project looking at decision making and how uh, the individual like social uh, how an individual's social position and also the collective structure uh, facilitates different types of decision makings. Uh, so if, you know, how would they make how, how did choose between uh, a risky or safe options um, and yeah, how they how they manage uh, against uh, other individuals. Uh, now, I, I think what's is surprising is that um, poaching of primates in general continues to be a thing. And is it still uh, uh, the traditional meat and body parts? Is it specifically for uh, uh, the, quote, pets or anything else? Or is it just sort of a, a general mix of reasons why people are still poaching uh, chimpanzees and so buying and selling? Yeah, I think it's it's a bit of both. Um, they the, the trades just facilitate each other. So mm -hmm. when poachers go into go into the wild habitats, um, and I think this is probably true for a, um, a lot of primates um, and also maybe other exotic animals that are captured for these for these reasons, um, in order to uh, in, in order to capture, uh, for example, a baby chimp um, to then sell as a pet. Um, they will be defended by their by their group, uh, particularly by the mother, but also by other um, individuals. And so, if you want to get that baby chimp, you have to slaughter uh, whoever tries to defend them. Um, and so, it it kind of goes like both ways. If you're going, if you're hunt, trying to poach them so solely for meat, you might encounter a mother and an infant, and then decide, okay, cool, we can do both things, you know, or you know, or, or vice versa. Um, because yeah, the, the selling of the meat can be really lucrative and also same for the, for the baby as well. Um, I think, yeah, they, they can reach up to maybe like $10,000 in, um, in, the in the black market. Um, but the sad, the sad thing is the poachers who actually sell them typically don't make anything nearly that much. It kind of goes, the, the trade is like multi-layered. So it's, they move, they move hands from, uh, different parties. Um, yeah. and it's always then. Yeah, someone at the end who is getting like the big, the kind of big payout, and they're the ones who are like facilitating this, uh, this trade as a whole. It's very uh, unsettling to know that it continues to happen, um, particularly with the the scope of information we have from people like you and your colleagues and predecessors who have studied primates, and we know they have these deep emotional connections and social networks. Um, they are so similar to us to consider them significantly different in the grand scheme of things is almost folly in my opinion um like we're, we're you know uh, a couple of chunks of gray matter maybe away or a walmart or two closer but uh they're they're so significantly uh, similar to us and you you talk about in your article from the conversation the number of ways that chimpanzees are used, and we don't need to, to dive into all of them as it is rather depressing and morbid, but it's uh, one of the, the newer issues, or I suppose maybe not newer, but a new switch on these issues is uh, the instant uh, fame of social media that people can attain if they have a picture with a chimp or a video with a chimp. And uh, from your perspective, this is something that is in part driving some of this issue. Yeah, so I think I think this problem has existed for um, for for generations. Um, I don't even know when it would have first started for people to keep um, to keep chimpanzees as pets. But um, I know, for example, my, um, like family members have told me that like when they went to uh, Spain in like the in the seventies and eighties that they would see um, people on the on the piers or in the um, on the beachfronts with with chimps that they could take photos with, you know, and then you can buy the photo and and stuff and they're wearing like silly clothes and, and stuff like that and so you know it's been it's been it, it's been a problem for a very long time um and i think social media has just revealed like the real scope of um i guess not only like how many of these animals are being kept in these conditions but also um how little 
people really seem to care, I guess, or, or seem to be aware of um, how damaging it is for the for the animals individually and as a, as a species and like the, the threat that it can have on populations in the wild. Um, and so, yeah, it's really, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really hard thing to address because it's kind of ingrained, I think, into a lot of uh, communities that animals are for our entertainment and they are for us to to use as we will and so yeah you sort of referred to the um some of the stories of the chimps and those were just the ones that i thought were appropriate to put on the article because there are some really horrific stories yeah. of these guys um of what they've gone through um and it yeah it screws them up for life like even even just the most um even the most like tame uh capture and uh treatment as a as a pet like the ones that were not treated as horrifically as others still carry carry with them the scars of a life in captivity you know i mean we see it with we see it with um animals in zoos for example like the stereotypic behaviors that they do of a lot of like pacing and rocking and things like that and um it's all yeah virtually every rescue gym that's here has some kind of um either physical or emotional scar um that they are going to be carrying with them probably for life um but the uh, i suppose the nice thing about a place like this is that it um where they have these big complex social communities that they can be a part of they they do integrate over time and they they learn their natural behaviors and they um they learn they learn from others basically they they learn how to become chimps again yeah. because of the the new peers that they have and so that can that that allows us then to to share with the world uh, more naturalistic content of how these animals should be, what their lives should have been like in the wild. Um, and unfortunately, they won't get there, but that's how they could have been if they were allowed to. Yeah. Well, it's getting them as close as they can at this point. And, and I'm curious yeah. on that note, with, with humans, we know that trauma, long-term trauma, can be uh, uh, found to impact physically our bodies. And uh, yeah. I, I have a great book, The Body Keeps the Score, all about trauma and the impact it has on the brain even grief has an impact physically. Do we see these impacts as well in chimpanzees and other primates? Or is that something that is sort of exclusively human at this point? Um, so but the impacts of something like grief is, um, I think, yeah, it's under a bit of debate with regard to uh, primates, um, including chimps. There's a lot of, there's a lot of research about, um, it's something I've become a bit interested in in recent years. Um, the concept of thanatology and uh, how how uh, mm -hmm. humans and other animals process um, process grief and like dealing with like uh, I guess knowledge of like their own mortality and then that of others um, and there's some research on chimps to show that they do have they do have some uh, responses to when individuals that they are close to pass away there's some research actually at chimpanzee of individuals that have died from um, from natural uh, circumstances. And how the group has responded. There's um there's uh, like an increase of displaying. There's um uh corp corpse cleaning um, using different tools. That was something that one of my collaborators and supervisors, um, Dr. Edwin Van Leeuwen, um, studied himself. Um, and also actually, I guess to um talk about someone else that I'm close to, uh, uh, another researcher, um, Zoe Goldsboro, um, who's currently working at um, Constance University in Germany. She also found that um, she, she did a, a case report of um, chimps in captivity in Arnhem Zoo. Um, a, a female uh, lost uh, an infant, and they they found an increase in affiliative behavior towards the mother um, in the months after uh, losing losing their offspring. Um, and it looks like potentially that they may have been consoling, you know, the the mother and trying to yeah trying to help her feel better. Um, and that's you know, it's, it's one case and a lot of people will probably dispute it, but there's no reason to assume that these animals wouldn't have this response to, uh, to their peers passing away. And so I, I also don't know, we, we, we'll never know really like how, um, the individuals at Chimfunchi, the ones that have been captured from the wild, we'll never know how they have processed, um, losing their family and watching the individuals that they were close to in the wild. Uh, being slaughtered by poachers. Um, they were maybe too young to remember. They were maybe too young to process it. Um, but uh, any of them that maybe weren't 
that when babies, it wouldn't be unreasonable, I think, to assume that they could that they could carry those scars. Um, and if not, they may also have gone through a lot of other trauma in their in their cap in their capture and in their what I would call imprisonment. Um, that also might then manifest at a later date. Um, which, yeah, I mean, I think we see with the some of the stereotypic behaviors that they that they exhibit. Um, yeah, it's quite tragic uh, to know that they, they are experiencing not only the horrific nature of it, but then have that capability to to feel the way that we might um, or another way of feeling. Uh, it's, it's so hard to, to try and describe that, because as you said, we, we as of right now can't know, really. We, we have to make some assumptions based on what we observe, but to know that it has been caused or it happened at them almost i suppose right they, they are victims of all of this who are experiencing it and without sanctuaries like this that suffering just wouldn't end until their life ended um and, and how sad that is and uh circling back to the the social media aspect of it um you you make a point in here so this is i'm going to be a little all over the place here as things come up and i've got questions i may not get into but um you make a note in your article that uh, it's Limbani, a chimpanzee who lives in Miami, has nearly 800,000 followers and a 1.5% engagement rate on uh, Instagram. And for context, Kim Kardashian's Instagram account has an engagement rate of around 0.65% and 364 million followers. Um, so uh, why, why is a chimpanzee getting a better engagement rate than Kim Kardashian, who is the queen of social media in so many ways uh what what do we know is causing that difference is it our emotive reaction to an animal is it something in the algorithm or is it maybe all of the above as life often is well i i can see why social media doesn't want to address this kind of problem um i can see why people find this kind of content really engaging why people like to like to watch yeah. uh, other individuals um engaging with with exotic animals um, because you know you see it. I mean, we see it with every kind of animal, from a from a dog to a hedgehog up to you know um, uh, pygmy marmosets, which are called finger monkeys on the internet because you know they're as big as your finger. Um, which is obviously like the just that name itself kind of like says enough about um, like the des the kind of desensitization to the fact that these animals should be should be natural and should be uh should not be on our fingers um but yeah i i i i, I think i think it plays into a lot of the um maybe the this might sound kind of a bit condescending but uh, or patronizing but i don't mean it to be um necessarily um but i think when when we're young we we imagine uh, I think interacting with animals in these these kind of ways, it's something that kind of just manifests at a, at a later date. We're really into animals, you know. It's, that's why zoos are very um, geared towards geared towards kids and geared towards families. It's because um, they find it really exciting to uh, to experience these, you know, vastly different species to us, of like all different all different types, and that engage in many different behaviors that we would never uh, experience if we didn't have, uh, you know, or that we wouldn't see if we didn't have zoos to go to see and um you know i think that's i i do think that's maybe something that manifests at a later date when we're when we're adults that we still sometimes you know hark back to those days and we see you know we see someone like playing with a chimp and we're like oh i'd love to do that i'd love to go and like cuddle a chimp and give him a squeeze and stuff um you know and you don't kind of think of the the ramifications of what that is and i guess that's <laughs> again this sort of sounds patronizing and i don't really mean it to be but um we sort of bypass then the rational part of our brain that says, wait a minute, where the hell did this chimp come from? Um, because, because I think I, I haven't, uh, I haven't done recent research, but, I, I'm fairly sure, um, nowhere, nowhere online do the, uh, owners, um, I use owners with uh, quotation marks there of Limbani say where this guy came from. I don't, I don't think that information is out there. Um, and they they also interestingly like to uh, use hashtags saying not a pet yeah. on their posts, which I find really ironic because they are <laughs> it's all, all they do is is show um, this chimp in a pet context. They they dress him up in clothes and they show him um, around with tourists who yeah pay an extortionate amount of money 
just to spend a few minutes with the guy. Uh, and then they rake in all of that money and none of it goes towards saving chimps in the wild. None of it goes towards, you know, um, protecting the habitats of, of them. It, none of it goes towards rescuing in, individuals that uh, probably came from similar circumstances to him in the wild. Um, and I'm, I'm open to be being corrected on that if there is information about where Limbani came from, but I couldn't find it anywhere. Um, and yeah, so I can, I, you know, I can see why people can, can find this kind of stuff really engaging. And then I can also see then why social media companies don't want to take a stance on it because it will continue to drive, it will continue to drive, um, a lot of virality. And I still get stuff on my feed that I, you know, I've, I've really tried hard to, uh, <laughs> to curate the algorithm of my social media to avoid this kind of stuff coming up. Um, but even just the other day I got, a. Um, it was like a, a, a tiger in a swimming pool, uh, chasing people out of the pool and like everyone being rightfully very scared because there's a tiger in the pool. Um, but then there's just absolutely no context about like, why is there, like, why is there a tiger in the pool? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like who is owning this tiger and not taking care of it? Where did it come from? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but with our, you know, with our six second, um, attention span, we don't, think about we don't want to really read more into it or, or find out more about like why that comes from we just we find it funny we send it to our friends and then it, we move on um and yeah we you know we, we've got a lot of things to to care about in the in the modern age there's a lot of causes to get behind and a lot of um personal stuff that we have to deal with um but yeah it's going to take a bit of time to um i think to change the, the wider public attitude and thinking about you know, not just chimpanzees, but other exotic animals um, and their place in the natural world, um, as well as our own, I suppose. Yeah, and that's, it's really interesting that you bring up that short attention span, but I, I'm also curious about the desire to be close to wildlife and other non-human animals, and, and not dogs, cats, you know, what we would consider companion animals in North America and much of Western Europe, but... Um, for example, a big issue in Canada is people doing bear selfies and it is insane as it sounds. It's people going to a place where there are bears and trying to get a selfie with the bear or getting closer to the bear for a photo and then talking about how incredible that experience was. And I, I appreciate that. I, I would love to go walk up to a bear and give him a scritch on the ears, but I also recognize myself that a the bear probably doesn't want a scritch on the ears from me uh b if the bear decides he doesn't want a scritch on the ears from me even though i'm a big guy that bear's bigger and faster probably um and it's putting my needs ahead of everybody else's in that moment and saying what i feel i deserve or need outweighs any potential consequence or any other concern even if it's not intentionally done as you said i think there, there must be some underlying uh, rationalization taking place at times. Um, is there, is there more to that issue of people wanting to be close to animals or wanting to experience animals that we can look at engaging in a new way? Or is this sort of a, uh, you know, it is simply part of being human and we don't have other ways of engaging at this point? Yeah, I think, I think that's maybe something we're always going to, um, that we're always going to struggle with is yeah, I think, I think people find it hard sometimes to engage with things if they can't do it themselves or if they can't, um, have it close to them. And so being able to be close to a bear and take a selfie with it, they'll maybe remember that experience forever. And, um, it might lead them to caring about bears more in the future, but it also might then lead to a lot more people doing the same thing. And then a lot of people getting mauled or, um, potentially a lot of bears being, you know, being then captured and being raised in a house um, and made to do uh, silly tricks uh, just for someone's Instagram clout. Um, yeah, and I think that the um, the kind of concept of putting like my, my needs ahead of um, someone else's is also very prevalent in all of this. It's um, it doesn't tend to be, uh, I think, people that um, that care for like other. <sighs> okay, so I, I, don't, I don't think it's always this, the same people. Um, sorry, I'll, I'll start again. Sorry, I hope you are able to edit this. <laughs> I sometimes just. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, I, we're good. I sometimes no just, I, 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 um, I speak before I think sometimes. Um, that's what my mom, my mom always said. Um, so, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think there is a lot to the idea of um, of individuals of us as humans putting our needs above 
those of others. And that's not just a case of, um, of doing it to animals, but also doing it to other people as well. Um, and it tends, I think, to be the same kind of person. Um, I don't have data on that, especially, but at least when I see, you know, the type that when I see the content, it seems to be the same type of people that I wouldn't expect to really care for the average Joe on the street, the ones who are, um, you know, the ones who are keeping these animals and um, and exploiting them for their own gain. You know, it, you know, it, it's it's quite sad that like there are people out there on Instagram who care more about getting followers and getting likes than they do for uh, the protection of um, you know of pygmy marmosets in the wild, and that's. You know, I, I, I find that sad, but I think it's just a, yeah, it's, it's some kind of disconnect that I think some people have. And perhaps because we don't really live very close to nature these days, um, for some people, you know, having a dog or a cat is not is not uh, exciting enough for them. They need to have something else that kind of that reconnects their, their primal urge, you know, to be at one with nature. And they think that having you know, having an exotic pet, something that, something that they can, something powerful, I suppose, that they can dominate, maybe is a, is a way of satisfying that, that urge. Um, because I, I think that's the only reason why maybe you would want to keep an animal that powerful. Like if you, you know, in order to, because yeah. it was often used as a status symbol. Um, the same thing with bushmeat, for example. It, a lot of the time it is, it is sold in context where you want to show your status and your wealth to somebody. And so if you can serve smoke chimpanzee meat that you can't really distinguish from any other kind of meat. Um, if you can serve that to your guests at a dinner party, they, you know, they will think, wow, this guy's really impressive. Um, and it's the same, you know, with, uh, just for example, people in, people in the Gulf, which I think is where this, this tiger, the example of the tiger video came from. If you can show that you have a, you know, a pet tiger or, or a pet chimp to your friends, they'll, you know, that they'll think more of you. Um, which, you know, in many cases, might you know for, for certain people not me but certain other people might might think that um yeah it feels very uh uh patriarchal as well in its uh origin of this that power and status and strength and dominion over nature as they have said um as opposed to actually integrating with nature or being connected to nature in a very real like i i want to plant an apple tree in the backyard and get a little four by four foot pond that's how i want to get closer to nature restore some habitat make it feel more natural all of that i mean the idea of having a raccoon hang out all the time you know that that doesn't appeal to me because there's something wrong with the raccoon if he's hanging out all the time but again different focuses um one of the things that we, we should really get into is the solutions to this problem. Um, we, we've clearly shown the, the issue of it, and now it's how do we make it better? Uh, you know, it, it in some ways, it sounds like it would be pretty straightforward. Hey, Instagram, stop posting this stuff or have verification. But as you've noted, there's a lot of money happening behind the scenes with some of these things. And it's a whole lot easier for a large corporation to just not really pay attention to it and keep getting the eyeballs on their app or on their website and therefore advertising as opposed to taking on a, uh, you know, a social justice stance that is inclusive of the environment and uh, wild beings. So I guess sort of from the government point of view and from the individual point of view, what are some of those options we have? Um, yeah, this... <laughs> I guess I could go on forever, um, but I guess there's there's also like um, a, a lot of it is very I suppose individual based and like we can do everything um, we can do all of the right things ourselves and it won't you know we won't really see uh, see the change but if um, but if it can all head somewhere towards a, a, a global opinion shifting um, of how we of how we think about the natural world and how we uh, and how we effectively exploit it and trying to change those attitudes that is really like the only way forward um you know i i report every single one of these videos that i see on on instagram every time it comes up every time someone sends it to me i report it and i know it doesn't do anything i know nobody's ever gonna uh the instagram aren't gonna care they're never gonna actually take down limbani's page or something like that but maybe one day they might and maybe one day um if enough people are shouting about it and enough people are caring then they will start to uh, to gradually change because they do, it took, it's, I think it took them a while still to even introduce animal abuse as uh, a thing that you could report. Um, and so now it's just a yeah. case of broadening that definition. Um, so that they are aware that these things, uh, that if, so if, if an exotic animal is being kept in a human house, 
it means that either that animal has been taken from the wild or it has been bred from a population of, of um, like a bred from a group that, you know, should still have been in the wild. But it's, it's somewhere it has come from like just being removed from their natural habitats. And so no matter, like no matter what, it is still uh, exploitation, exploitation in that regard. Um, and I really, yeah, I yearn for the day that social media companies turn around and say, okay, you know, if you, very, very, you know, because I, I think it can be very clear definitions. If you show anything like this, it goes, then it, then it goes away. Um, but it's going to take, I think, a long time. And I think, um, I think, I think governments for sure can do, can do a lot. Um, it's taken a very long time just for even the UK to, uh, to outlaw primate pet ownership. Um, I think it took like a lot of different steps and a lot of different loopholes, but they are finally now, probably next year, um, going to outlaw keeping primates in in certain, I can't remember the, the specifics, but in certain conditions that would effectively outlaw them from being kept as pets. So they're not, even even with that, they're not like explicitly saying you cannot do this. They are saying you, you, know, you cannot do this one thing of keeping a primate as a pet. They are saying you cannot keep a primate in these conditions. And so then you will have to give it up to a, to a sanctuary like Monkey World in the UK. Um, and yeah, that's the, and for something like the UK, that's for 4,000 to 5,000 primates, I think. It's, it's crazy. Um, and they are of all different kinds of species. Um, um, but that's just the UK. And the UK is relatively a small country compared to uh, the ones who I think are, um, who maybe have like the biggest problem in this regard, such as the US and China. Um, and I think encouraging those countries to to change their mind on this sort of thing, the, you know, I think we're still a long way away from that happening. Um, and so it's really, it's something that, um, it, it feels all the time like it's a, like it's an impossible target to, to reach. And I feel like there's always going to be opposition because there's always going to be, um, there's always going to be the, 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 the people who have these animals that will, will really, they'll always fight back, I think, against this because they believe that they are doing an okay thing and that they believe that they um, should be allowed to continue. Um, but I think if we can, if we can collectively just reject uh, this kind of content as, you know, just not, not just as individuals, but if we encourage uh, each other to do so, anytime it comes up on our feeds, if we all, um, if we all just don't show engagement to it, if we don't, you know, we don't click on it, we don't, uh, we don't share it to others, we don't comment, we don't, you know, we just, <laughs> we can just report. Um, and uh, eventually then these companies might start to take some notice. But I think, yeah, we need, there needs to be um, uh, someone going I think, directly to them and, and making the case. Um, and yeah, I don't know who that, <laughs> I think, I think, this has been argued already from many different spheres and it's not making much of a difference, but one day, one day it will, um, in the same way with, you know, a lot of these different causes. Um, yeah. And I guess, and I guess also just, if we know someone, if we know someone who keeps animals in this, in this kind of condition, because I've met, I've even met people in the UK who, um, who are keeping, uh, <laughs> who are still keeping primates, um, in their house. I've met people who like know people, um, and you know the the conversation has kind of flowed towards the kind of they, they 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 hear you know they speak to me and they have conversations about these kind of things and then they speak to their friend and then they find out that this sort of thing is happening and um, this is literally this is one particular case I won't um, give too many specifics to not out the person but they um, they did communicate to that person that uh, you know I think maybe you should give the the primate up um, they as far as I'm aware haven't done it yet but. Um, you know, one day, one day they might realize maybe if they, you know, the conversation keeps happening, eventually it will get there. But at least you know, in that regard, like next year it should be outlawed. So we can hope at the very least that uh, we see that happen. <laughs> and honestly, every, every step leads to that path. And I think it's very frustrating uh, for, for us as human beings to know that change takes time, but at the same time, not have a patience button. Um, you know, we look at significant cultural shifts in how we perceive things and it takes time. It may seem like it was a very quick change, but when you then scale back and look at human history or sociology, there were a lot of moving parts happening for a lot of years before it hit that precipice and everyone went, okay, you know what? Smoking isn't good for babies. You're right. Let's change it. But you know, for a time 
women were being prescribed or pregnant women were being prescribed cigarettes to help their baby's health. And mm -hmm. that, you know, it's a bit of an extreme example, but it didn't just change overnight because of a report in Reader's Digest. Uh, it took years and years, and you can still walk down the street in any direction from my house and buy cigarettes for 10 bucks, um, despite everything we know. But it is, right, the taxes increase and the health care uh, issues become more apparent. And I think that's true of a lot of these issues. The more we talk about it, like you said, sure. the more likely we are to see some change. For sure. And I think um, with, with regard to like chimps, for example, for example, and other exotic animals, there are so many um, there are so many positive things that have that have occurred. So um, massive restrictions on being able to use uh, different kinds of primates um, as lab as uh, for like testing in lab laboratory conditions, um, mm -hmm. shutting down a lot of uh, uh, circuses effectively, or the use of uh, animals in in circuses in many different countries and that list just keeps on growing um hopefully soon it'll be every single country um so there are you know there are positives to um there, there, there are way there, there are opportunities to look and say okay we have made yeah we have made some progress but there is still going to be um i think a long way to go um i guess also one one thing um one thing that's always said to me by um the people who um who rescued these animals um is uh the, the the thing I guess, and it also ties into like a lot of, to um, to wider issues as well, um, is that the the thing that facilitates the trade a lot is habitat loss. Um, the more habitat that is lost for these animals, then the easier it is for the poachers to find it. And also, it then means that it's harder to reintroduce them to the wild if they don't have enough space to give them. And if that just keeps increasing, which it feels like it always will, um, then you know the the problem will always exists. We're always going to have to keep them in uh, uh, in captive conditions because they don't have uh, a natural home to go back to. Um, and so, I suppose anything anything individuals can do to just uh, to prevent wild habitats from being taken away, it can only be a good thing. You know, um, the re rewilding movement in the UK is growing um, by the day, and it's um, I'm not sure. Maybe it's the same in Canada as well. It's a big talking point now. Um, yeah. Eh, we're, 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 we're still all about cutting things down for housing and agriculture and it's fine. Soil doesn't need to stay good. It's, it's good. We'll just degrade it a bit. It's fine. Nothing's wrong. No one look. Yeah. I guess, I guess it, uh, with the UK, I mean, we already reached a point where we had no more trees. So, um, yeah. you know, we just had, I don't, you maybe saw the story about, um, the, the tree at Sycamore Gap, um, that was cut down, the Robin Hood tree. Um, oh, yeah. It was a really, yeah, it was a really iconic photo um, and a really iconic tree. And um, I think they're still figuring out what exactly happened. Um, but the only reason that tree stood out was because every other tree was taken down in that area. You know, it mm -hmm. should have been covered in a forest. And um, I think that's something we always need to uh, remember is that, um, you know, uh, like in that, in that regard, we need to remember um, this one tree. It's really sad that this one tree got taken down because we all had a connection to it. But you know, every other tree that, that gets cut down, we also should feel some kind of connection to because it it, it facilitates the uh, life on Earth, which we are a part of. Um, yep. And you know, and we are we are part of a, a very delicate worldwide e ecosystem um, of many different species. Um, there's no you know. I would say there's no like end goal of evolution. Things just kind of, um, I mean, I'm not the only one who says that. Like <laughs> every every evolutionist <laughs> says that. But um, yeah, there's no end goal of uh, of this process. We all kind of just like we all, we all emerged out of um, out of our different pathways, um, and we all have a, as much of a right, I think, to life as as each other. So we should, as as we are able to, we should support uh, other animals having that same right, right to life and being protected in their natural habitats. What specifically are you looking at with the chimps at Chimfunchi? Is, is there a certain uh, a hypothesis or are you just sort of generally observing and looking for pattern? Um, to be honest, on a daily basis, I do just watch them and wait for them to inspire me in different ways because they, they always do uh, random stuff that surprises me. Um, we kept saying this, me and uh, another researcher here, um, these guys, are really cool because you you watch them for a long time and you get to know them and you start to predict what they're going to do who they're going to hang out with everything else you, you start to pick up on their patterns and then you get really comfortable and used to it and then they do something out of the blue that you just don't expect and they <laughs> you know and, and and that's what's really cool is that they they are super unpredictable which i guess is also 
what makes them really bad pets if you wanted to try and keep them in that way mm. um that they they cannot be controlled they are fully uh, undomesticated wild animals um and yeah i I, I, I do spend a lot of time just watching them and, um, and observing their social dynamics, um, you know, who's, uh, who outranks who and who they're connected to, um, how tolerant the different groups are. We looked at how, how much they are able to, um, to co-feed close to each other, which is a marker of, um, of social tolerance. If they're able to, you know, um, if they're able to allow others to be close to them when they're feeding, it indicates that they have a, you know, they have a, a higher amount of social tolerance as a as a unit, um, and that's that's still stuff that I'm doing now, um, and some stuff that I did for my for my PhD. Um, actually, for my PhD, I studied um, kind of circling back to the stuff about, um, uh, I guess, uh, the the complex emotionality of these animals. Um, for my PhD, I studied empathy, so I start, I, I I did a lot of reading about um, the. Uh, capacities that I have and um, a lot of it I didn't study myself but I, of all the reading that I that I did I discovered just how um, you know how little there is to distinguish between the empathy of humans and the empathy of of at least chimpanzees if not other other great apes and other primates as well um, and maybe a lot of it is because of how similar our social structures are you know that um, we tend to live in uh, similar kinds of uh, family groups um, there's a lot of parallels there. There are obviously massive um, variations as well, but um, we find that they can uh, take others' perspectives. Um, they can understand when an individual might have a uh, have a wrong uh, conceptualization of the world in front of them. You know, there's a there, we we can see that they can predict when uh, others might do certain things. Um, and we know that they can respond to the emotions of others as well. Like not only are they really emotional animals themselves, sometimes they can just scream for hours and it's, uh, um, nah, it's maybe not that long, but, um, <laughs> but they, uh, yeah, we, we, we find that they have a lot of, um, uh, they have a lot of emotions and they're really good at, uh, picking up on how others are feeling as well. And then also responding to them. Um, and so part of my PhD was looking at, um, reassurance behavior, how they, how they treat each other during tense competitive times when individuals are feeling uh, nervous about uh, impending competition and when individuals are upset, how they how they treat them, and we find that you know they do they are they do seem to be aware of when an individual needs comfort, and um, that comfort itself seems you know in certain circumstances it can be really effective at actually reducing the individual's distress. Um, there's a lot of wow. papers actually showing that chimps. Gym conservation does reduce um, uh, like the physiological feeling of of anxiety, um, <laughs> and it can repair then the social bonds too. Uh, if individuals have been fighting, they they use these con like they they use reassuring body contact to repair social relationships as well. That's fascinating, I, and that's so similar to us in so many ways. Like you said, I mean that's <laughs> and I, I was just thinking as you were talking about this too. It would be fascinating to compare what you know about chimps in these social situations and everything to what society as a whole went through with the pandemic and lockdowns and coming out of that. Uh, my personal uneducated view is we all forgot how to socialize um, and it has led to an increase in anxiety and distrust and things like that, which then thanks to the bipartisan fuel of social media is just growing and growing and growing divisions. And mm -hmm. I, I think it would be fascinating to kind of take those behaviors, um, was it from the uh, the etymology of it, really break down everything and look at, okay, what are people doing? And then take those descriptors and put it on another species and see, well, how would they resolve it? How, how would chimps resolve everyone being sort of scattered and then coming back together at some point with a lot of uncertainty? Would they do better than we would do in that circumstance or... You know, how would they deal with one individual who is not doing well through some emotional state or uh, a physical limitation? Is, is there something that we can learn about ourselves by watching another species sort of go through these similar things? Sure. I mean, I, I, I mean, looking at the the individuals here, we see that um, you know it takes it takes a little bit of time, but they can be rehabilitated um, into being uh, into being chimps after their after their previous trauma. And that's also something um, that they are 
dealing with uh, bonobos in um, in uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo at another sanctuary called um, Lolia Bonobo, and they they rehabilitate orphaned bonobos and then they introduce them into family groups and then when the time is right they release them back into the wild into a into a release site and so they are effectively you know the, 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 these animals are really. Um, they're really robust, I suppose. Like they're really, you know, they, they they can they really feel emotions and they are really um reactive, but they are also really able to to adapt um and to re um rebound from previous setbacks. In the same case as, you know, if they have a fight, they are really they are really capable of reconciling um a broken social bond. Um and I think that's yeah. But the thing is with with, with chimps, like a reason that sort of pandemic example chimps don't have the option of you know communicating with each other via yes. um via uh social media like they wouldn't be able to have a uh an interview conversation from the north america to um southern africa but um but i think yeah they you know it, it's something i think that we've been that we all did miss for a big period and i know i know some people who are still really um we find it quite hard to be in like, big in big crowds and um, amongst like people that they don't know very well. Yep. And it's stuff. It's like they they you know maybe they had these sort of tendencies in the past, but it maybe was exacerbated by this forced distance. Um, and yeah, you know, touch touch and connection and communication is so important to us. And as as nice as it is to be able to communicate online, nothing will ever be the the feeling of actually being close to the ones that you want to be close to and actually being able to uh, to speak right directly next to them, like even just sitting with them. You don't have to be touching them, but just to be sitting with them. Yeah. It can do so much more for you, I think, than, um, than a, face, that a, a face-to-face conversation on the internet could ever do. And I think we, we definitely need to remember that in, um, uh, in the kind of growing uh, development of, um, you know, things like VR and, um, yeah, like different AI and stuff. Like we need to be very conscious of how important it is for us to retain our, um, you know, what makes us what makes us human and what makes us uh, a part of the natural world, which is to be to be social and to be direct in how we are social too. To learn more about Dr. Brooker's work at Chimfunchi Wildlife Orphanage Trust, visit chimfunchiwildlife.org or his Durham University bio page. Links to both are available in the show notes for this week's episode at DefenderRadio.com. I'd like to thank Dr. Brooker for his time, all the way from Zambia, in three different locations over the interview due to intense nature sounds and the limited office space at a functioning sanctuary. And I encourage everyone to check out his article from TheConversation.com, which is linked in the show notes. If you'd like to stay up to date on episodes of Defender Radio and the work of the Fur Bears, follow us on social media. Links are also available in the show notes. Until next time, I'm Michael Howie for Defender Radio, reminding you to stay informed and stay strong. Defender.